Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Today's topic is dealing with problem areas in your landscape. And our presenter is Nancy Berlin, a natural resources specialist here at the Prince William Office of VCE. And I'm going to be ready, Nancy. Anyway, sure. Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm, I may not um, answer your problem. Um, I'm not going to cover them all, um, but uh, we always have some resources to help you with specific issues. And um, you can contact our Extension Horticulture Help Desk. I'll, I'll shoot that um, email up to you in a few minutes um, if, if I don't cover what you're interested in. <clears throat> Let me see if I can advance these. There we go. So I'm going to provide some food for thought for problem solving, um, just to get you your, the gears turning and looking at your landscape in in um, different ways. Um, again, I, I won't be able to provide in depth site specific information uh, for you for each participant, um, but you can contact us again through the help desk. We're not engineers. Um, you may need to hire a, an engineer or a qualified contractor for some um, more complex issues, but um, we're going to be recommending some planting schemes that will address uh, common landscape problems. So we're going to deal with it from a, a horticulture uh, aspect. Uh, this is, these are the areas we're going to cover. Slopes, uh, poor turf in the sun, poor turf in the shade, uh, wet, wet areas, uh, riparian or stream side areas. Uh, they're also called RPAs or resource protection areas, and then a, a few things on stormwater um, solutions. The first thing um, you want to do is take a look at your site, and um, I would suggest looking at it over a longer period of time during different weather conditions. Um, you know, what, what it's doing now in the drought is going to be different than what it would do in a wet fall or um, a very cold winter. Um, here's some variables for the site conditions to consider. Uh, that's uh, full sun is considered six to eight hours and partial sun about three to six hours. Shade is less than three hours. And consider the orientation of the site and, and where that sun is coming from and how much there is. And what soil type do you have? I mean, do you have new construction where all the topsoil has been removed? Is it rocky? Um, does it have low organic matter? In urban soils, that's um, commonly an issue, as you know. Is it foresty or loamy? Um, and and clay is doesn't is not necessarily a you know a problem soil. It just needs more spaces and more organic matter put in. So don't despair if you have clay, because we all have clay. But uh, there are really common sense ways to deal with that type of soil. Uh, consider the topography, and more on that later. What rock types? Plant, the plant material, I mean, the parent material of the rocks that are underneath the surface that are making up that soil, and that will that will affect the pH and, and uh, um, amount of organic matter that sticks around. Uh, what the plant community is that's already there? Um, is there flooding or wet spots? The dimensions of your site, and and take one problem area at a time so that it's not overwhelming or too expensive. Um, the access to water for irrigation and what plant types you need, whether you need evergreen, whether you need screening, whether you want deciduous trees or fl spring flowering, um, those, will, those will be um, some con considerations. So um, the first, first thing we're going to tackle is slopes. Uh, here's some creative ways to handle slopes, but we're going to look at a number of different um, uh, scenarios. <clears throat> uh, Prince William County has a lot of slopes. Uh, this is um, the county mapper. You can go to the Prince William County website and um, uh, look at county, look for county mapper. And, and the yellow lines here, if they're very close together, the closer they are together, the more uh, slope you have there. Um, so you can see in Prince William County, there's Holdley, Holdley Run, Neabsco Creek. So this is in the Woodbridge area. There's a lot of challenging sloped properties in this area. 
and so uh, here's here's the town of Occoquan. Um, you can see there's a lot of a lot of um, going down to the um, floodplain and the and the Occoquan River. Um, there's there's a lot of slopes they can deal with. So um, and the the, the soils can be really challenging on these um, slopes in general. Um, it's as you know, it'll erosion will occur, but um, if it's covered with vegetation. Uh, or erosion control structures, and that's we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, signs of erosion are tree roots exposed, gullies, uh, sediment deposits, rock outcrops where the soil is washed away. And if you can't do the work yourself, it's there's no shame in hiring a qualified professional. Um, you can go to Plant Nova Natives, and they have a list of qualified professionals that will help you with some you know native plants and stormwater. Uh, plants are considered one of the best erosion controls to hold soil in place, and that's that's good because we like plants, <laughs> and um, adding plants can really do a lot for the environment. As you probably realize, common sense says that slopes are generally drier in some areas, and at the, at the top of the slope, generally, that, that happens. So you want to choose plants accordingly and look at each area on the slope for um, microclimates, um, and more on that in a few minutes. Work in a small area at a time because any area that you disturb on a slope and that you're not immediately planting, and, and, you, um, and once the plants have to establish, um, you don't want to remove things and disturb the soil um, in a large area. Like if you're removing in, you know, invasive Japanese honeysuckle, you want to have a plan for uh, replacing it with something that's going to hold the soil in small areas at a time. Avoid planting in straight lines or rows. A staggered placement of plants will <coughs> provide a, prevent water from going straight down the hill really quickly. It'll slow it down some. some. The mulching between plants is, you know, is a good idea for your, for your back and for um, uh, maintaining um, an area free of weeds. And so some, some kind of matting, not landscape fabric, but some kind of mat, matting that degrades in time once the plant's established would be uh, wise to keep that, uh, the plants in the mulch in place. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And you can consider certainly a raised bed or a terrace. Um, different things can be added. Um, we'll, we'll look at some pictures. This is a, a, a slope in um, Wayne, Pennsylvania. Is that, I think that it's... It's, no, maybe it's in Delaware. Chanticleer. Look up Chanticleer, somebody, and, and put the, if you would put the, um, the link in there. This is my favorite public garden. And um, this is the gravel garden. You can see she's used slabs of concrete, and you can even reuse concrete. I had a friend that uh, had a, a patio busted up, and she retained the concrete instead of sending it to the landfill and worked it into her landscape. They, here at Chanticleer, they put some zero scape. Uh, gardens in and um, really creatively used that on a slope to slow the <clears throat> slow the erosion, uh, add beauty, add habitat, and it's it definitely worth going to that public garden. It's, it's a day's drive, um, half a day's drive uh, from North Virginia. So remember, there are microclimates on a slope. Um, colder air air rolls down that hill. And it's, a, it's the coldest at the bottom of the hill. Um, and so that warmer air stays at the top and then, um, and then as it cools as it goes down the hill. So think about that when you're uh, selecting plants that can handle maybe, um, you know, a, a cooler temperature down the, down the bottom. We're in zone 7A and B, and, um, but, but that can uh, vary uh, depending on, on the microclimate on your topography. So rocks can create a microclimate too. We um, in, uh, One good example of this is at our teaching garden in Bristow. We have a, um, a herb garden and it has a rock wall in it and that rock wall can retain heat over the winter. So some of the things that normally, some of the herbs that normally dry out, I mean, normally are too um, sensitive or too fragile for, for our 7A, 7B climate can overwinter because of the, the amount of um, warmth that those rocks retain. There's usually poor soil at the top of the slope. All the good stuff rolls to the bottom. Uh, that just makes common sense. <clears throat> uh, so planting on a slope. 
I love this picture. Um, this is this is a picture um, done by Fido Studio, Thomas Rainier. He's a landscape a designer. He lives in Northern Virginia, but he does um, he, he goes nationwide doing uh, landscape naturalized landscape designs. And so here he, here his crew is planting on a slope. You see at the top they have a a log that's made out of core. Um, and that's a coconut fiber matting, and they pro they have some plants. In it's impregnated with either seeds or plants. They have uh, some matting, um, not landscape fabric, but they have some matting uh, on the steepest part of the slope, and you're, they're putting in some specific trees uh, and shrubs, and I'll, I'll share those with you. He has a great Instagram um, account, so uh, Fido Studio, it's P H. YTO studio. So native plants are a good choice for a slope. They have deep soil and they have good water holding roots. And um, <clears throat> we'll look at some uh, specific examples. So ground covers that tend to root along the length of their stem, which is uh, and, and form a mat. And now there are many invasive plants that do this. But I'm going to share with you some native plants that do this. Uh, also, and, and those kind of roots are called ry rhizomes. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. But rhizomatous shrubs and perennials are a good choice because they have those modified stems that run underground horizontally. You can picture Bermuda grass, not a great example of something I would want in my yard, but it has the, the right kind of roots to plant on a slope to hold that soil and to form a network a colony of plants that will um, um, be lower care for you. Um, uh, rhizomatous plants strike new roots at their nodes. So each little knot in a root is where they get new roots coming out. Yeah, there are places you don't want rhizomatous roots, but on a slope, I think they're a really excellent idea. Deep rooted plants you want to look for and native grasses and perennials fill that bill. Plants requiring more water should be planted at the, at the bottom of the slope. Drought tolerant plants toward the middle and the top. Don't mow a slope if you can avoid it. it may, it's dangerous and it makes, uh, and it, turf tends to get scalped when you try to, to mow it on a slope. So uh, give yourself a break. Uh, consider some alternatives to turf on a slope. And again, consider those microclimates at the bottom being cooler, at the top being warmer. Here's some rhizomatous shrubs for slopes. Um, fragrant sumac, uh, these are all native shrubs. Uh, Rus aromatica uh, is a low growing, it's um, this one right here, and it has good fall color, has interesting leaf shape, is fragrant. Um, these are not the, the poison sumac. Po we don't have much poison, we don't have poison sumac here in Northern Virginia unless somebody imports it, which we hope that doesn't happen. But fragrant sumac is a low-growing shrub. We have at our teaching garden in Bristow, and it, it's, it's really good at holding the soil. And it can handle uh, part sun, full sun. I have mine in, in shade, and it, it's fine. It does, it's doing fine, but it just doesn't get as lush in shade. Gray dogwood is a beautiful native shrub with great spring into early summer blooms, great berries for wildlife, uh, nice shiny leaves. Um, and then staghorn sumac, you'll see this along the parkway, and it has, um, it has a, a really cool flower that's kind of yellow green in the uh, spring and summer, a pyramidal um, flower stalk with yellow green flowers, and then it's followed by those red red berries that are attractive to, to birds. And um, it does form mats. It will sucker all over the place. But if you have a slope that you don't want to have to mow and you want something that'll uh, fill in nicely and provide habitat and food for wildlife, that might be your choice. Here's some rhizomatous perennials that are native. Uh, from left to right, we have blue, um, blue sedge and wild ginger is a great ground cover for shade. This uh, Canada anemone, uh, anemone canadensis, uh, will grow in sun or shade, and it does a good job of filling in um, areas so you don't have to uh, uh, take care of them so much. Uh, and it has a beautiful spring flower. Actually, they're still blooming in, in my yard now. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge can handle some sun, 
uh, but it also kind of looks grass-like. It does tend to flop over a bit in the shade, but um, you when it flops, you don't have to weed there. Coreopsis verticillata here, threadleaf coreopsis is another rhizomatous um, perennial, native perennial, and blue mist flower. So this is, a, this is what a rhizome looks like. You can see that each of these, this is probably Bermuda grass here, each of these little nodes will sprout anew. So while we don't want that with Bermuda grass, unless we have a warm, warm season turf grass, uh, we, might wanna, we might want it for some circumstances. Let's talk about shady slopes. You know, they're a little more challenging. So um, a tree canopy cuts down on erosion. So if you've got shade there, and it's not just from your house, uh, that, that tree there is intercepting the and slowing down rainwater, keeping erosion down, um, and um, soaking it up. And it binds the soil to prevent erosion. So turf requires six to eight hours of sunlight. So if you have a shady slope, I would recommend you not even consider growing turf in that. that that's probably the most common question we get for our Best Lawns program. Turf requires six to eight hours of sunlight. So don't try to grow turf in less than that. Look for some alternatives. Here's some alternatives for, for shade. Uh, all these are growing well in my yard in dry, in dry, um, dry shade under the under forest canopy or under you know mature trees so pacara um, golden ragwort and um, woodland sunflower this elemis is one i've added um, in my uh, under my canopy and it's a, it's a native grass that has a beautiful uh, seed head and also grows just fine in the shade uh, uh, an aster, uh, this cal either calico aster or woodland aster. Here's a hydrangea that could serve as an understory underneath the canopy. Um, and here's uh, native columbine. Here's some other things you can consider ferns. There's a lot of different ferns that can handle uh, full shade. Um, to get established, they might need some irrigation, but once they get established, they, they should do fine under trees. Here's a goldenrod. Uh, goldenrods are one of the target um, plants that if, if you want to help pollinators, goldenrods are good ones. Uh, and this one is not super aggressive and it does grow in the shade. It's wreath goldenrod, uh, solidago cassia. And, and this is a great ground cover, this uh, partridge berry um, under, a, under a canopy or on a slope and woodland geranium, geranium maculatum um, that can handle some sun, part sun and shade. Sedum ternatum, a lot of the sedums that you find in the garden centers are for full sun. In fact, almost all of them. This is, a, this is a sedum that will grow in the shade and does a great job of filling in uh, so you wouldn't have to mow. And here's uh, three carexes or sedges. And you can see they're rather grass-like. They, um, they lay down more in the shade. They provide a great ground cover, preventing erosion. Um, uh, Carex pensylvanica can handle some sun. Um, also, part sun. I, I, we have them in a couple places in full sun at the at Novant in the Healing Garden. But um, carexes are are really adaptable to a lot of different conditions, and that would keep you from having to um, mow on that slope. So, gabion walls are just rocks that are in kind of a wire basket. So here's a picture of some gabi a gabion um, retaining wall here. And certainly these, this is more of expensive option, um, but, and, and you can certainly do dry laid stone walls there. It's, I th find them a little more challenging here to make them um, look this good. <laughs> Mine don't look quite that good. I probably should have hired somebody. And then you can also get these precast units and to do a, a retaining wall here with those. And that's probably something like Trex or, or one of, or a similar product that looks like wood. And we have a master gardener in Dale, in the Dale city area. And he's done his whole backyard in these terraces with, with, I think he's used real wood, uh, but he has, um, it's a little steep, but, but he has uh, beehives up there and uh, a, a lot of interesting plants for on each terrace. Here's another picture, uh, you know, just to get your, uh, the juices flowing of some, and I'm not sure all these are natives, but I, I think the, the design aspect of this is, is really interesting looking. 
Um, you can do rock retaining wall or dry riverbed. Um, one of our master gardeners has a fantastic dry riverbed and she's planted all along it, uh, pollinator attracting native plants. And so what happens is the, on that slope, the, the um, rainwater can slow, get absorbed in because the rocks aren't concreted. They're just loose rocks. And uh, the plants help retain water along the edges. I think it's um, a really cool idea. So sunny slopes, um, again, here's the Chanticleer one again, or in here's a gravel garden that's um, at Chanticleer also, or um, maybe a naturalized meadow. It can be naturalized or more formal looking. It doesn't have to be unruly. And if you avoid turf, you don't have to fertilize uh, because a lot of that fer fertilization will uh, run off on a slope. So um, turf is a high uh, maintenance crop. It needs fertilization every year to be healthy and thick enough to combat weeds. Uh, but if you don't have, if you put native plants in, you don't have to fertilize or mow. Here's another one. This is in Prince William County. Um, you can see, I think it's junipers and some dogwoods. And I hope those aren't Bradford pears. We don't want to recommend those. <laughs> okay, here's another. Um, and this is Green Springs Garden. It's a, it's a gentle slope, but you can see they've, they've really um, put some interesting plants in here um, and some rocks in between. Uh, we have a rock garden at our teaching garden in Bristow, and it, it's not on a slope, but uh, the rocks that are put in there are at interesting angles, and I think it's worth a visit just to see that. Um, we have a master gardener, Spencer, who manages that bed. So some native grasses for erosion control, and these take mostly full sun. Uh, big blue stem and little blue stem and switchgrass, and uh, you can get you can get cultivars of these in almost any color. Um, there's one one uh, little blue stem that's called standing ovation. It's kind of purple. Um, the middle switchgrass is probably Shenandoah, and it has a burgundy reddish. Um, but um, and many of the garden centers, the 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 more uh, the bigger garden centers, not box tours, will have these cultivars. Although I have started seeing some of them in, in uh, like the box stores too. Here's what I use in my yard on a little slope. Um, it, it, and I tend toward the naturalized or messy type of landscaping. I, I'm, I'm not always um, as tidy, um, but this is yarrow. Uh, and that's the, the white Achillea millifolium, just the straight species. And then some Coreopsis mixed in there. And then I usually throw some annuals in there too. But the, the yarrow stays green all winter long. It has a ferny foliage um, that covers the ground nicely and replaces turf on, on areas I don't want to mess with mowing. So if you have poor turf in full sun, we have a plan for you. A thick, healthy turf shades out weeds. This, this picture on the right here is from a site visit we did uh, in Gainesville area. And you can see um, the soil is super compacted in between these little tufts. And the, the little tufts are growing just fine. But in between, the soil is poor and it has, um, it's very compacted. So um, we would recommend our Best Lawns program. If you have... Um, Turf at turf area and it's full sun. Uh, we we can give recommendations for other than full sun, but again, you want six to eight hours of full sun to be able to grow turf successfully. And uh, a master gardener, uh, we fill out an application. Um, you can contact us for an application. It's also on the Prince William County website. Maybe we could put that in the chat. Um, and a master gardener would come, usually a team of two, uh, to measure your square footage, take a soil sample, and then you get a, pres a prescription basically for your lawn um, prepared by Natalie Walker, our, um, our best lawns coordinator, environmental educator. And so that and those those results are written in a user friendly way to sh show you exactly what you need to do and when you need to do it to have a, a thick, healthy turf that uh, com competes with weeds well. Or if you don't want turf, you could consider a pollinator garden, a meadow, or conservation landscaping. This is the before picture. This is uh, uh, Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. Let's see if I can get this. Oops. Let's see if I can get my 
cursor there. This is the before picture and this is the after picture. They put in a meadow um, and it's designed to benefit the environment. Uses locally native plants that are appropriate. Includes a plan for removal of existing invasives, habitat, air quality, conserves and cleans water, slows down stormwater, builds healthy soil, and it can be managed without any pesticides and fertilizer. So if you want, a, want an alternative to turf, certainly that's an option. So uh, poor turf in the shade with, um, this is uh, an area in Manassas City. Don't, they've tried to grow turf here for years and we've asked them not to try to grow turf there anymore because the soil is poor, it's on a slope and it doesn't get um, even six hours of sun. So we gave them some alternatives. Uh, in shady areas, instead of trying to grow turf under the trees, uh, turf and trees aren't good friends. They compete with each other and the, tr and the tree will always lose. Uh, turf is allelopathic. That means it has chemicals that sends out to compete with trees. And you don't want to be mowing in between trees. That takes so much time and it also damages the trees often if you accidentally nick it with the mower. So join your trees in an island and, and mulch that island to keep the turf and the trees separate in your landscape. And it's a lot easier for you to handle uh, as far as maintenance goes. Or you can use shade tolerant ground covers. Here again, it's Carex pensavanica. Uh, hard to full shade, although I, I have grown it successfully in, in a little more sun than that. And, it, and it's a good turf alternative, it never needs cutting. Although you could certainly weed whack it, but it, it only gets you know a, up to a foot tall. Uh, moss, consider moss. If you've already got moss growing, um, moss isn't very, very tolerant of foot traffic. It, um, so you can add a path in between maybe, and you can transplant patches of it. Don't take it from natural areas, but if you've got it growing in different places in your yard, you can transplant it. There's also companies certainly that you can purchase the spores from and uh, make a moss milkshake and pour it over uh, to get to encourage moss to grow. Um, it favors compaction um, and it favors shade and wet areas, poorly drained soils. It does need to be kept moist. Small turf alternatives for shade, uh, hookera, americana, or alum root. Again, wild ginger I mentioned before, uh, foam flower, woodland phlox. Uh, these are all things that could grow in the shady areas. Goat's beard or aruncus, um, fern, different, many different ferns, maidenhair fern being one of my favorites. Turtle head, that does like a wet area too, green and gold. So uh, these are all native alternatives. Here's a few more. Um, and these, so the, the sedge stays green all winter. It does die back uh, in the, in the, in the um, really cold weather. Colin, these are both spring bloomers, and this is a fall bloomer, uh, late summer to fall. So a naturalized shady lawn is not everybody's cup of tea. I'm going to fess up here, and this is, I didn't, I don't want to mow my yard anymore. And so I've, taken out the any invasives and this is just an area of my yard that I'm not mowing and it, you can see it's not uniform it's not used for soccer anymore from my kids are grown but all of these plants growing in this this corridor right here which is full mostly mostly shade I would say six hours of full shade it, and these are all native plants. And you can see it's not for everybody. Some people really like a tidy lawn that has well-defined edges. I like this because it supports pollinators. It supports the soil. So the natives that are in here, you can't really pick them out. Um, there are some asters over here. This is a this is a woodland bed over here on this side. And this is a forested area here. But this little corridor has elephantopus which is a native plant. It has jun a juncus, a, a, um, a rush, juncus tenuous, has pilea pumila, and it has nimble will. And so, and it, they, none of these get any taller than like, uh, they're probably at, as tall as they're going to get. And they're probably about three quarters of a foot tall to a half of a foot tall. So I don't have to mow them. I don't get chiggers in this area. I don't get ticks in this area because it's, it's low enough um, um, 
and, and, and it's my cup of tea, might not be yours. So some wet areas, figure out why is it wet? And is this something you need to correct or can you, can you just plant and uh, take advantage of the wet areas? Is it a runoff? Is that why it's wet? Is it a seep? Or is there a downspout draining in there? Or why is it wet? And if it is wet, you, you, do, you might want to manage it for mosquitoes. Um, and so I uh, just want to put a quick word in here for mosquito treatment. Uh, we don't recommend that you hire somebody to kill mosquitoes or one of, those, one of the companies that comes and sprays. Uh, Doug Tallamy, if you Google uh, home, let's see. Homegrown National Park. He has a video on uh, mosquito control and you put a five gallon bucket out, N not if you have little kids around, but a five gallon bucket that's protected uh, from little kids. And um, you put a handful or two of straw or hay in it. That attracts female mosquitoes who lay their eggs in it. And then at that point you put in those mosquito bits, which are um, not toxic, uh, and that kills that kills the larva that the female lays in there, and that is a much better option than mosquito spraying because that will that will affect all the insects in in the ecosystem in your yard. So wet areas that are uh, um, wet area is not an area for a rain garden. You don't want you a rain garden is something that you um, a landscape device that is only good. Um, it, it has to be dry out in 48 hours or less. So you can choose plants that like having wet feet. If you decide not to correct this area, you can always put in a French drain or drain tiles, reroute your downspout, plant a swale. Let's look at some pictures. So he, um, there's a swale. It's kind of a sunken area. It, this one's covered with turf. A, this is one that's, I consider this a swale too, but the, the literature calls it a vegetated stormwater conveyance. And instead of just turf, it's a sunken area that has uh, plants that will absorb a rain barrel. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. Or um, these areas that uh, you can put plants that like wet feet in, in an area that you have a, um, um, a, a, a pipe coming into. Here are some trees that like wet feet. Um, you'll, you'll find these, they also, many of these can also handle dry areas too. Here's some shrubs that tolerate wet feet. Um, uh, let's see, these are all natives. Uh, the bayberry, it needs specific growing conditions. Um, so you would want to check out, you know, for your specific site. Uh, here's some herbaceous plants that like wet feet. And some sun, cardinal flower, great plant for wet areas. Milkweeds like it. I found that obedient plant likes wet areas. I, uh, if you can keep the deer off of it. Uh, New York ironweed likes wet meadows. Joe pie likes wet, wet but it can handle some dry. Um, a lot of us have sparse understory with deer pressure. And it's in full shade because deer take out the herbaceous plants and the small shrubs that are underneath the canopy. Um, <laughs> got a, a bunch of families of deer living in my yard right now. And so the forest layers are what we want to aim for. And we might need to select our forest layers carefully so that deer don't eat them. And we may need to manage it with maybe a deer deterrent because Forest layers are really important for birds and other uh, wildlife. Uh, those layers provide not only habitat and food, but um, cover and um, Im important uh, ecosystem services. And he, this, this is available, uh, I think this is on our website, uh, but this is from Audubon of Northern Virginia. So we have an Audubon program. We can come to your property and uh, do an evaluation. We're not looking at how pretty your plants are, but we're helping you to evaluate it for habitat. Here's some understory trees that tend to be deer resistant, but not deer proof. I would say that the best one here would be spice bush. Deer won't touch spice bush. I think that's the forest plant of our future. Um, these are 
you can find a list of plants that are deer resistant at the Rutgers um, website. All you have to do is Google Rutgers deer resistant plants or plantnovanatives.org also has a list of some deer um, resistant plants. But remember, we're not talking deer proof. We're talking deer resistant because we can't promise those little fawns in my yard are trying everything. Here again, some shade tolerant grasses for more naturalized areas. Um, this is a bottle brush grass, and, and this is northern sea oats that can handle some shade. This is nimble will, considered to be a weed by many, but it's a native perennial grass. Don't mix it with your fescue or your bluegrass because it'll create, it'll start to brown up when the weather gets cold, and then you'll have nice green grass with these patches. Uh, so I would recommend that only for naturalized areas. And here, this prairie drop seed, it needs some partial sun, but look how pretty it looks, and it, it will actually spread. Here's, again, some more resources for deer-resistant plants. We also have a YouTube uh, presentation. We have so many presentations that you need to take advantage of on our YouTube channel. It's VCE Prince William YouTube. And uh, we do have a presentation by Leslie Pawson on deer resistant plants there. So uh, let's talk about streamside, uh, the benefits of having um, plants on either side of a stream or is it protect it protects the stream from erosion, from pollutants, from flooding, creates habitat, provides shade, which is important for stream temperature. And it's, it's a beautiful corridor uh, in Prince William County, a RPA or a resource protection area is 100 feet on either side of a stream. Now, I know there are many parts of the county where that is, uh, people have been living there for years and they might be mowing right up to the edge, but it's not a recommended practice and uh, it's protected under state law and local ordinances. So um, in general, you can't disturb or remove plants on either side of a body of water. And that might be a lake, a perennial stream, an intermittent stream. Um, and you can go to Prince William County uh, government. Uh, our website has a resource protection area um, uh, brochure that you can read online. And you have to call Public Works before you cut or clear in any riparian area or put up a shed, gazebo. This is a protected area for, for water quality. This is a site visit that we did. You can see people have pired, piled their logs there and um, thrown grasses and stuff into the stream and they're mowing right up to the edge. That's not good for water quality. Here's, here's a really extreme example that created a huge flooding uh, problem in a lot of people's yards and homes. Um, and we did a site visit here and made some recommendations. We recommended those rhizomatous shrubs and some of the core matting and some um, herbaceous perennials that would form mats too, but we recommended native plants for this. Uh, you can see this, these are some of, this is not at that area, but these are some of the practices. This is a core log or a bio log on the right, and, and it has uh, sedges, sedge, it's been impregnated with sedge seeds and they grow and they, um, this deteriorates over time. It, these are stakes where it's staked into the side. And then the, the sedges are uh, seeded in here or, or plugged in here and that will eventually hold that. And you can see these are double stacked uh, bio logs here. This is, um, in the uh, eastern part of the county, uh, Lake Montclair, you can see the understory here is practically gone. So we did a site visit here with this homeowners association to recommend uh, some replacement understory grasses, herbaceous plants, other herbaceous plants and, and shrubs, native shrubs. This is along the Occoquan. Uh, um, you can see it's been mowed right up to the edge and, and what, this is what occurs when it's mowed up to the edge. You don't have a buffer to absorb the stormwater or to create a barrier um, to slow the stormwater down. So we would recommend either just stop mowing, uh, plant some um, shrubs along the edge that are native that uh, like that uh, particular, like an alder or some of those other rhizomatous shrubs I, I mentioned. 
here's a Veterans Park. Uh, the the uh, Prince William Conservation Alliance did a stream restoration along here, and you can see they're doing what we what we were just talking about, putting in uh, the logs and some matting and some some shrubs and trees. And here's what it looked like after. So um, a beautiful habitat, uh, good for water quality. Okay, here's another picture of that. So let's talk about storm water briefly. So um, when you have green plant cover, you get a lot more infiltration and it slows down the runoff. There's 10% runoff when you have that, that, um, that green infrastructure. But when you have impervious uh, surfaces or, or, or surfaces that the water just hits and runs off, about 75 to 100% um, it runs off. And a forest is your best solution, but we can't have a forest everywhere. And we certainly can't have a forest in our yard in, in the suburbs. So a few other options would be like swales or there's that dry river bank, river um, bed here. This is, a, again, a, a conservation area or a swale. Um, some get, some, here's some stop dams made with rocks. These are permeable pavers. Um, or you can use a treatment train, which combines a meadow plus maybe those permeable pavers, uh, a, a number of best practices that could be added together to create a better situation so there's not as much stormwater runoff uh, uh, either in your yard or you're going into your neighbor's yard. So best management practices um, uh, can, can be used. And um, Chesapeake Bay landscape professionals are listed. Um, there's a directory online that can help you with some of these um, particular planting schemes. So what you want to do is you want to slow down stormwater, spread it out, soak it in, and maybe capture it. And some of the things that you could do are like a, a rain garden or swale like this. You want to keep your soil covered, plant things with deep roots, consider a rain barrel, uh, again, a, a swale or a vegetated conveyance for that water that, that'll soak it in, or maybe a rain garden uh, if, the, if the rainwater can come in and come out within 48 hours. And so um, you want to replace these impermeable surfaces with permeable surfaces. So we've got an awful lot of this in the suburbs, and we want to convert some to this so that we can have more infiltration. So plant more native plants. It turns out that's a, that's a really good uh, and fun thing to do. Or you can add a rain barrel or two. Usually with the size of the houses we have, we need more than one rain barrel, maybe two or three or four. Uh, because a one inch rainstorm um, creates quite a lot of stormwater and one barrel is not going to be enough to capture it. Uh, so you want a roof of some sort to capture the rain barrel from or a down, disconnect your downspout and direct it into the rain barrel. This is a picture of Denver, Denver Botanic Gardens and this is uh, by that landscape designer Thomas Renier and he posted this on his Instagram. Look at that. If all of our curbs had this kind of naturalized planting along them, uh, we probably would have a lot less problems with rainwater uh, collection. Um, it would reduce the runoff into the streets and ultimately into our waterways. Rain barrels are good uh, for, for irrigating ornamentals, but not for your edibles. Um, things come off the roof that we, we're not going to want to eat. Um, and it, um, it's called, it's non-potable. Um, and it's good to connect to drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is the preferred method, so you don't, um, you don't, you're not wetting the leaves continually, that you're getting it right to the root system. Rain barrels have, need some management, though. They have to be cleaned and maintained. They have to be um, translucent, transparent, so light doesn't go through, because that prevents algae from clogging the unit and it has to be safe. You have to have safety features on it so that birds don't fall in, um, children don't fall in. And so um, there's a lot to that, but uh, we can point you in the right direction uh, to do some reading on this if you're interested. 
Again, we have a fantastic team of Master Gardener volunteers who staff our Master Gardener Extension Horticulture Help Desk. And it's just mastergardener at pwcgov.org. If you have a question, you can send pictures to us if you want something identified or um, help with problem solving. Um, you can contact us by email. Oops. Uh, we have a lot of classes coming up. Um, July 10th, we have a class on growing mushrooms. Uh, Adam Downing from Extension Specialist in Forestry is going to help, to read the question. help us learn to grow shiitake mushrooms, uh, cut flowers. September 4th is cover crops and uh, a fall plant sale. Uh, and uh, October 2nd is permaculture and yoga. So you can sign up for these on the Prince William County website. Uh, there's a link to uh, register online. And I, I'm, before I do this, we have um, to be notified of our upcoming Wednesday classes. We're going to take some breaks in August. You can sign up for e-notifications by going to the Prince William County website. And if you'd like to become a Master Gardener volunteer or hear more about it, we have three information sessions. You only have to pick one. Uh, and you can, um, two of them are in person, one of them is Zoom, and the class starts in mid-September uh, for the candidates that are selected. So we'll go back here and entertain some questions. Nancy, um, my neighbor, Brooke Lohr there, is uh, asked how she, can she get a site visit? Okay, so. She's on the Occoquan River. She's another neighbor that's on the Occoquan River. Um, I, I think you should start with a best lawns visit. You okay. know, get one of those applications. Mm -hmm. um, and Natalie can certainly address any um, questions about, you know, environmentally sensitive areas along the Occoquan through that report, whether it's turf that she recommends um, you know, and good turf management or whether she recommends some alternative ground covers. She actually has uh, a lot of woods uh, and a resource protection area and a lot of erosion. So it's a little beyond best lawns. Their lawn is far away from the Occoquan. That, but that's, Thomas, maybe you could weigh in, but I think that still that might be a best lawns to start with. Or Audubon at uh, Audubon at home. Yeah, that would be a that's an excellent idea. I'll give you both those uh, resources, Brooke. I'll walk them over. Good question. Um, there's a question here from Grant. Our condo association has lots of Barbary bushes, too expensive to replace. Do they need to be pruned? And if so, when is the best time to prune them, if at all? Problem is when pruned, they leave thorns everywhere. Yeah. Well, Barbary, I know, I know, I know it's expensive to replace them, but they do harbor ticks. They're, and they, they are heavy seeders that, and you'll find Barbary uh, invading a lot of natural areas because it's considered invasive. So, my, you know, my first choice would be to replace them, maybe a little at a time. Um, I, I don't think there's a, I, I mean, you could, you could probably prune them. <laughs> um, you could probably prune them most, most any time except for late summer. I, I probably wouldn't prune them now because of the drought, you know, um, the, the best stop and, and you're just going to have to, you know, clean them up as you prune to, because those thorns are terrible. And that's why they harbor ticks because the rodents go, know they're protected in there and they go, the, the white footed mouse goes in there and they're the ones that are carriers of Lyme disease. And so that's where they, have that have cover and can be protected. And then that, that white footed mouse transmits that um, tick, that infected tick to, to deer. So um, not only are they harbors for rodents, but they harbor Lyme, Lyme disease. Um, are there any resources for putting in a dry river? 
I would I would look for a professional that uh, that would um, I would look at dry riverbed. I would Google that, look at some images on there, and then I um, and figure out what native plants you might want to put along the sides of it. And then I would find a professional if you're not up to the work. Uh, maybe with the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals website, there's a directory on there, and they would be competent in choosing, um, you know, the right size rocks and uh, for your slope and, and the right plants. Um, we had two birch trees die, not sure why, maybe age. I'd like to plant more trees. Do I need to worry about old root systems or will new trees grow around them? Good question. Yeah, it is. Um, so birch trees, do you know if it was a river birch or was it a white birch? Probably river. Real large. Any feedback on that? Let me ask. Edward, can you hear us? Do you want to let us know? Let me scroll down and see this. So not sure white bark. White bark, okay. So, so white birch are not well suited for this area. First of all, there's a, um, there is a disease, and um, they're they're not um, they're not a good a good choice. They do like and they do like it wet. They do like um, you know like a riparian area or a floodplain. Um, so that might have been the reason. So you, you want something that's not uh, depending on where they are. Uh, is it dry in that area? Um, I'll wait for. Anyway, I would. I, you can you can always replant as long as you can um, get enough space to um, put the root ball in with about. You want a hole that's about two to three uh, times the width of the root ball, and you want to remove all the um, burlap, the wire basket any any kind of plastic and you want to free the roots so they're not circling and then have a wide hole uh three three times the size of the root ball um sometimes a a smaller tree or shrub is a better idea they're easier to manage and they're easier to plant um, many landscapers plant trees wrong so you want to make sure that it's planted correctly we can send, if you email us, we'll send you instructions for planting that are more extensive. You can, as long as you can get between the roots that are already there, you can put it, you can put a tree or shrub in there, but you can always have the, you know, the, the stump ground um, and, uh, and let it de deteriorate on its own. You can also drill holes in the, in the, you know, cut the tree up off as low as you can then drill holes in it so that water will infiltrate and that'll rot the the stump over time Did that answer your question you said it was wet mostly so you would recommend river birch probably i if if another birch died there i'm not sure i would put a i don't know river birch would be a better option but that's a huge tree we're talking 100 feet tall um, and it, 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 it would depend. I, I think a description and a picture of the area would be helpful to send to our extension horticulture help desk. So I don't have to guess at, at what the situation is. Okay. Yes, the help desk gave them that information. Cool. So I don't see any other questions. Anybody else have a question for Nancy? I don't see any more. Let's go back to this screen here. Let's see. Yeah, don't miss our don't miss our mushroom class coming up on the 10th. We've got some these are in-person classes at our teaching garden. That's gonna be fun. Nine o'clock. And if you want to be a master gardener, um, you can sign up for one of these information sessions by emailing, or you can go to the Prince William County website and there's a red a link to register there. One last question came in. Where do we find the core matting? Uh, you can look online for that. If you're hiring a contractor, they will know where to get it. Um, 
uh, forestry suppliers, Ben Meadows, S Southern states might have it. Um, you know, Amazon might have it. I, oh, you know. desk is, is listed some places. Okay, cool. Cool. Thank goodness for you help desk people. Oh, they are awesome. Contact them anytime with your questions. All right, everybody. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, you're always very welcome. Something. Always learn. And and this will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, Could you give that uh, again? Somebody asked the. Yes. So we're going to be. There you go. On a, thank you, Thomas. So quick. What a mess. What so a quick. They type. All right, everybody. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy. And we'll see, see you around. Okay. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. If you're interested in lawn care, please contact our Best Lawns Coordinator, Natalie Walker, at nwalker at pwcgov.org. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.